Hello, this is Dr. Tom Gruber from the National Community Rights Network, and um, I am here with a uh, for a follow-up uh, conversation with Will Falk, who was um, uh, one of the people who were involved in the filing of a lawsuit against the state of Colorado for the rights of nature for the Colorado River. And, uh, you know, the, the suit was filed, of course, and there's some interesting events that have transpired and uh, a lot of lessons learned, a lot of success gained in that front, uh, even though the, uh, the, the case had to be dismissed. And, um, and we want to talk to you about that today because I think that this is a big, uh, I think it's a sign of a turning point in the collective consciousness of the world uh, regarding how we see nature, our relationship with nature, uh, and how we're going to end up protecting nature uh, rather than destroying nature. So, Will, please welcome. We're really happy to have you back. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. Thanks, thanks for all the great work you're doing, and thanks for uh, bringing me back on and giving me an opportunity to talk about what's happening. Well, now, Will published an article in on December 7th in the San Diego Free Press um, uh, entitled, Time to Escalate? Question <laughs> mark. First ever rights of nature lawsuit dismissed. Um, if you'd like to get some background information on the uh, lawsuit, um, we did a really good uh, lengthy interview about this in our previous uh, uh, blog post from the National Community Rights Network.org website. And uh, uh, we posted the first article that Will wrote about this. And uh, and the interview is there. So uh, the background is, is there for you. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the information that we uh, uh, provided during those interviews, that interview, but we will be going on from there. And, um, and here's what happened. Uh, it, the, the suit was dismissed because the Colorado Attorney General filed a motion to dismiss uh, and threatened sanctions against Attorney Jason Flores-Williams. And um, in, in Will's words, um, he uh, threatened sanctions against Attorney Jason Flores Williams for the unforgivable act of requesting rights of nature. Flores Williams withdrew our case. Um, and so, um, Will, can you talk a little bit about this? In, in early November, shortly after... Uh, the state of Colorado filed their original motion to dismiss against the case. They privately sent uh, attorney Jason Flores Williams a letter threatening him with sanctions if he did not withdraw the lawsuit. Now, Jason spoke uh, with us, with the group of Next Friends, and we, we were planning on fighting those sanctions, and we were planning on uh, using the fight against those sanctions as, as another way to illustrate how the legal system is stacked against us. But uh, Jason obviously doesn't, he doesn't only represent us, he has, he has other cases, he had a, uh, he has a big uh, criminal trial coming up in January, and when uh, he responded to the, the attorney general's private letter refusing to withdraw the lawsuit. The attorney general on, on the same Friday afternoon sent um, a longer uh, motion to dismiss and then right after that sent uh, an official notice uh, that they were filing with the court requesting sanctions against uh, Jason. These sanctions are, are notorious for paralyzing lawyers that um, get them. They come with a threat of a fine to pay the opposing side's attorney fee for ever having to respond to, to the lawsuit that we filed. Uh, things, they can also, the court can also do things like suspend or revoke an attorney's license. So sanctions are uh, they're they're a strong threat from from the state, and they are they can be scary for for the attorneys who uh, 
Um, when you see them, especially for attorneys like Jason Flores Williams, who uh, was representing us pro bono, we were not asking for any financial damages in the case. So even if we won the case, uh, there would be no uh, recuperation of, of resources spent litigating the case. Uh, ultimately, um, Jason felt like he he was not equipped to uh, respond to the sanctions, and uh, he decided that he wanted to withdraw the case. Um, and and so that's what he did. Uh, so he, he voluntarily dismissed the lawsuit. And uh, right now, um, the, the, the rights of nature for the Colorado River lawsuit has, has been withdrawn and, and has been dismissed. Um, it's important to understand that the, the threat of sanctions were, was a retaliation tactic from the Colorado Attorney General um, against Jason. It was the Colorado Attorney General is constitutionally bound to represent the interests of the people. And by, and what they, by filing these sanctions and threatening these, threatening these sanctions, they show that they are more interested in protecting corporate rights than, than the rights of, of people and natural communities to, to live. So in a lot of ways, uh, the, case, the case was dismissed um, in, in, a, in, a classic, in a classic tactic by uh, the state of Colorado and by the attorney general to intimidate people who bring um, as I said, the unforgivable, uh, the unforgivable request of rights of nature, of rights of nature for, uh, for the ecosystems that give us life. Um, this is all not to say that, that the fight is, is not by any means over. And in fact, uh, we think that uh, the, the attorney general's uh, sanctions threat and the fact that the case has been dismissed in this fashion um, only confirms for us what we've we've already known, and that is that the legal system is stacked against us. That the government protects corporate interests over uh, the rights of of natural communities and and the humans who depend on them. And so, what we really want to encourage people now is to turn the anger that they have uh, after after reading about this story and after seeing what happened and turn that anger into, um, into next steps. And as I said, in fact, maybe even thinking about more serious tactics, uh, escalated tactics, more direct confrontations uh, with those that are destroying the natural world. The idea that the legal system is stacked is um, familiar to a lot of people. I know that um, if, if I had, uh, black or brown skin, I would probably know that the legal system is stacked at the moment of my birth almost, you know. Um, what we're dealing with here in Boulder County, for instance, is a population that thinks the system works and that um, we just need to work it more intelligently, you know. We need to do a better job to get what we want uh, for the environment and for communities and uh, that if we keep um, electing better representatives, we'll get better regulations. And so we will be able to um, have a better world. And, uh, you know, when, when we hear that part of the story, uh, those of us who've been in the trenches know that that's really false and that um, it's a, perspective that's promoted by the media and everywhere you look to try and maintain the status quo, to keep you in the hamster wheel so that you, you know, you see something horrible happening in terms of human or natural rights. And then you, you know, you um, organize against that issue and launch an entire campaign all centered around that one single issue and then you expend all your resources, you burn out, and then the same thing happens eventually is that either you have a threat of a lawsuit or you get a lawsuit or you, you, you um, 
you know, you pass a law, the law is, is preempted by the courts. And it seems to, to us that, um, you know, that we're not going to be able to, at least at this time, the odds of us winning in court are almost none. Um, it, it, would you say that that's kind of the, a, a correct assessment at this time? Absolutely. It's, it's, our, our case demonstrates that in a lot of ways. Um, there's, there's, I think there's an opening or, or the possibility that people misunderstand uh, what has happened here. The, the idea that if we, if we could have uh, somehow argued and beat the sanctions and then somehow survived the attorney general's motion to dismiss that, um, that the judge and the courts were going to magically have this epiphany and um, see things our way and decide that, yes, indeed, the river should have rights. I think that, that from the very outset, um, that was very, very unlikely to happen. And we need to look at how all the things that are, all the things that are stacked against us from the very outset. Um, so no, the case never got to the court so that the judge could hear the case on the merits. Um, but some of the barriers, there's a lot of barriers set up for that before that could have happened. So we, we can start even with a very simple uh, power disparity in, in the fact that Jason Flores Williams, a, a one attorney law office, a, a single practitioner, uh, was facing the Colorado Attorney General's office, which is if it was a law firm, it would be the largest law firm in the state of Colorado. Something right. like 480 employees work for the attorney general's office and they have an allocated budget of $70 million. Um, so just from the very beginning, they can throw a lot more resources into um, defeating the legal parts of the case than, than a single attorney can. Um, and and this is just one of the barriers where we're, this is just a, a practical barrier to ever getting into the court. Um, but once you get into court, and this is something we talked about last time, you run into the very structure of American law and um, you run into uh, doctrines and jurisprudence and philosophies that have been uh, so firmly entrenched in American law for three centuries that um, judges have very little power to to not rule the way that those uh, philosophies tell them to. Um, so th all the all these things um, make it very unlikely for for cases like this to succeed. And that what that does is it it you know I guess people ask well why would you why would you file a lawsuit um, if if you knew that. And um, on the one hand, that is, that is one of our points is, is we, a lot of people who still believe in the system, it takes actually walking them through that system, showing them all these barriers, having them emotionally invested in, in our cause, and then having those hopes and dreams and those false beliefs shattered uh, before you can actually convince them to um, think about other tactics to to realize that uh, working through the system might not be the most efficient way um, to to gain the to gain the changes that we know we need. Right. So then that um, that that begs the question. Then um, if if uh, the the legal system is not working, you know, according to the what we were taught in grade school according to its original intent <laughs> that it's something different than what we've learned something different than we have uh, been led to believe throughout our lives really I mean through all the media through television through movies and all this kind of stuff I mean we have a romanticized notion that the legal system is just and blind and it, you know, it, it, uh, it rules uh, for, for justice. And even the judicial system is called the, the justice system, you know. Uh, 
And uh, <laughs> the public relations um, uh, establishment in this country is, is very deep. It's, and uh, so we think that the judicial system is, is unbiased. We think that it's fair, and if it's used properly, it can change the world. And so we just keep trying to elect better officials and write better regulations. And for some reason, it doesn't work. It just keeps happening to us. I mean, you know, there's one horrible thing that a corporation does, and then another one, and then another one, and another one, you know, and sometimes they write better, quote, better regulations to help control the harm that's been done. But as soon as, you know, even that tiny little move to make things a little better, maybe happens, another one pops up, just like playing whack-a-mole. So there's a, there's a common, there's a unified, a common denominator there that unifies the whole problem into one problem. And we've been working for years to help the public to understand, you know, that, you know, if we, if we keep siloing ourselves into these separate issues and ignore the fact that we have to have a really good analysis of the real situation and that our activism has to be uh, realistically attuned to this, the conditions under which we're being exploited or under which the environment is being exploited, we have to do things that actually make a difference if we want to try and turn this around. So let's talk about the things that could really make a difference here, okay? Yeah, so I, I, what I wrote about in my article and maybe what I wasn't, um, you know, I, I think it was 2,200 words or something, which isn't, which isn't enough to really describe an entire theory for, for changing a whole uh, culture that is, seems so hell-bent on destroying what's left of the natural world. Uh, but what what I'm getting at is is we we need to we need an analysis that helps us understand what power is and how things actually get done in the real world. So um, I, I I started I started trying to explain uh, what it is about a rights of nature lawsuit that that we're actually trying to accomplish. What we were trying to accomplish for the Colorado River is we were trying to get physical protections for it. We were trying to help the Colorado River uh, flow to the ocean. We were trying to get uh, pollution taken out of the Colorado River. We were trying to uh, protect the snow that helps the Colorado River regenerate. We were trying to help all the different uh, non-human beings that live in, that in the Colorado River. And all of these things are, are real and concrete things that the, the Colorado River needs. The Colorado River, in, in one sense, the Colorado River doesn't need rights as these abstract ideas. The Colorado River needs humans to go and remove dams. They need humans to pull, or she needs humans to pull that pollution out of her. And so what, what I really want people to understand is if we got, if we did achieve rights for the Colorado River, that'd be great because we could go into court and we could ask the judge to order someone to do something physical to protect, to, to protect the Colorado river. She could order government workers to remove dams, for example, but, and this is the most important thing to understand is rights and court orders are not the only way that dams are removed. And I've, I've written this maybe not in a direct enough manner, but, but dams can be removed with explosives. Dams can be, can be removed with communities that are determined to, to take them out. Um, and that's what, that's what I really think the most important thing that has happened with our lawsuit is we start to get people to stop thinking only in legal terms, to stop thinking only in terms of, of, the state sanctioned avenues for change that we have to stop thinking in terms of electoral politics and to start realizing the power that we actually have the, the power that our bodies give us the power that our organizations can give us 
um, to go out and, and change the, the natural world for the physical better. Um, so, so how are we going to do this if, if lawsuits aren't going to achieve it for us? Well, I've listed a few examples of people who, who have really brave people who have um, arguably done with, with far fewer resources than, than those we face have done um, really tremendous things on behalf of the real world. So in, in my article and, and some, a group of people that I think if, if you're, if our listeners or watchers haven't heard of, uh, they should go check out. And that's, that's the valve turners. Um, this was a group of people who very strategically uh, understood uh, where the different shutoff, emergency shutoff valves along pipelines across the northern United States that were bringing uh, uh, oil down from the Fort McMurray tar sands in Alberta. Uh, they, they found out where those emergency shutout valves were. They found out um, how to responsibly turn those shutoff valves where they could shut down the whole pipeline. And all at the same time, they turned all the valves and they were able to disable, uh, I think something like 15% of the United States uh, fossil fuel uh, imports in, in one day, they shut all that down. And I think that there were five of them that, that actually did this. Um, so they didn't wait around for a court order to shut down a pipeline. They just figured out how to do it themselves. And I think in a lot of ways, uh, these were people who had tried to work within, um, within the system. In fact, I think uh, many, many of the people uh, were, were in their 50s and 60s, uh, were retired, had been involved in movements for years, and finally just realized that the tactics that they had been using hadn't worked and that they needed to take things into their, into their own hands. Um, there's another, there's another great example that recently happened, uh, that recently became news in, in the summer. And that's, uh, two young women, uh, who were associated with the Iowa Catholic workers, um, in Des Moines, Iowa. They, their names are Jessica Resnicek and Ruby Montoya. And they had been involved in, um, anti Dakota access pipeline, actions they they had been to standing rock they had seen the way that uh even nonviolent civil disobedience at standing rock didn't stop the pipelines and after watching all of this they taught themselves how to sabotage of the dakota access pipeline they taught themselves how to um, bore holes in pipes that were not uh yet bearing oil and the different procedures that um, the corporations then had to follow to to repair those and they they delayed construction just the two of them delayed construction of the Dakota access in certain places uh, for up to a month and six weeks um, again these were these were two women that didn't wait around for court orders they saw how how the government had failed them and they decided to uh, take matters into their own hands so that's what I think. I think that our tactics need, we need to start thinking about, um, about encouraging these kinds of tactics in our communities. This, I'm not saying that, um, these are the only tactics that are work that will work. And I'm not saying that, um, there aren't, there aren't other ways to support and there aren't other tactics that we should be using. I'm just saying that one way for us to become more effective in our movements is to stop uh, waiting for the government, for the courts, uh, for those in power to do the right thing, and for us to start to figure out how we can do the right thing for them. Um, you know, I think you touched on it a little bit earlier. I don't think that we have very much time left. Um, and in fact, for, for the 200 species that are going to go extinct today, there, there is no more time left. And so while we, while there's a lot of us who still place our hope in, in these systems um, and, and we're still kind of wasting time uh, trying to use those systems and still placing false hopes in tactics that have been shown over and over and over again not to work. Um, the living world is, is dying and um, 
I, I think that it's time to start thinking about these more serious tactics. Right. So, um, the, the, you know, in my work with the community rights movement and the community rights movement, the people who work in that field, you know, what we're coming up against is pretty much the same realization having, you know, tried to pass local laws to offer greater protections for nature and communities than those protections granted by the state and the federal government, you know, legal protections. And so, um, when we do this, you know, we fly up against the establishment who says, you know, that your, you know, your local laws are unconstitutional or they violate state statute. And, um, you know, the, the, the reasoning is just based on those established judicial uh, principles that you were talking about earlier. Um, and they're all assuming that nature is property doesn't have rights of its own. The owner of the property is the one who has the rights. Um, and they, the rights to do pretty much what they will with uh, that piece of nature, so to speak. If you could separate a piece out from nature, if we look at the Colorado River, you know, they can take the water and do whatever they want with it pretty much uh, within probably within reason, but they can certainly dump that water all over desert soil and and uh, let cash crops suck up a small percentage of it and the rest of it's just wasted so that the the water never makes it to the ocean as it did at one time um so you know the the ability to destroy nature we have nature as property and if uh and in our work what we want to do is point out the fact that long before you know, we began to have this uh, legal doctrine that nature is property. Um, there were people who regarded nature as something really divine, something that uh, was the foundation of life, which was life itself, and that the relationship with nature was what was important for them, uh, not the exploitation and domination of nature. And so there's that domination exploitation model, which is what Westerners have in their DNA. And then there's the, um, you know, nature as life, nature as sacred, nature as, um, as nurturing uh, point of view, which was the point of view of the Native Americans or the indigenous population in this continent. And, uh, so those two things are diametrically opposed. You can't really have one without the other. In fact, you can't have a magnificent empire without taking nature and gobbling it up and spitting out products and spitting out waste products uh, into the atmosphere and into people's bloodstreams. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a really interesting debate that's going on right now amongst everyone uh, as to Okay, so we have global warming. What are we going to do about it? Oh, we can't do anything about it. A lot of people think that, uh, you know, like Star Wars is, is uh, coming out again, and it's like, uh, you know, you've got this evil empire and the, the you know, Darth Vader, his, state, his statement that sums it all up is that, you know, resistance is futile. And to try and stop everyone from doing anything about anything, to paralyze everyone into inaction, into passive acceptance of domination by some supreme empire. And, uh, you know, the reality is, is that the rebels, uh, they were small in number and strategic, and they, you know, fire a torpedo and blow the Death Star up. Um, but the problem is the Death Stars keep coming back and the Empire keeps regenerating itself. And, uh, you know, I look at that and I see that, you know, in, in that story, there's a, you know, there's a, there are a bunch of parliamentarians that sit around this enormous room and, you know, and, and discuss uh, galactic law, you know. And uh, nothing happens. <laughs> it never stops the the primary cause of the up uptick in the empire. You know, it doesn't crush the empire. It's kind of like um, 
the James Bond movies, you know, well, uh, well, let's say Austin Powers, where, you know, Aust uh, what's a Dr. Evil, just he, he, his, his statement is that when he's talking to Scotty and Scotty's saying, well, you, you know, you, you get this spy and then, and, and then you, you, you want to put lasers on the shark's heads. You do all these things basically, you know, to sum it up and, and, and you never actually just like take a gun out and shoot the guy. I mean, why don't you just do that? And Dr. Ewell goes, Shh, right? you just don't get it, do you? You know, and so what we're doing is we're dancing around, um, you know, trying to, to maneuver and uh, all, all, all over the place, everywhere crushing down on is, is a system that's well-oiled, that's been planned and put into action for hundreds of years. And then it's working just perfectly for the corporations and and the extremely wealthy, you know, to to live their lives and to um, and to externalize the costs of all that they're doing onto nature and to the and to people, you know. And uh, so so we we're, we're we're up against this absurd amount of power. And we think that we're powerless because they have all the guns and they have all the laws and they have, they have the, the system of government. They own the economy. You know, it's, it's all in the hands of these enormously powerful people. But what you're, what you're reminding us of is that, the, that, that we're more powerful than they are. So could you talk about that, um, that pow power confrontation that we're going to have to go through because you know who was it that said in you know back in the founding of this continent this country um you know that that power concedes to nothing without um without a struggle yeah i think i think that was frederick Douglass, the right. great, great african-american abolitionist uh leader who, yeah, he said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, it never will. And I think that just in that example, a good way to see that was, you know, there was a lot of great work for four or five decades by different abolitionist movements to, um, they did boycotts, they did petitions, they did public demonstrations about the evils of slavery. Um, but I think that if we if we truly understand our history, it took a whole war to end slavery, right. and um, so power power conceded uh, slavery only after uh, millions of Americans um, gave their lives to to demonstrate that slavery was an evil and that it had to go from the United States, um, and I think that that I think that. One thing that is, I think, very difficult for many of us who, who are privileged to benefit so much from, from the shiny things, from the, from the benefits that uh, the empire brings to us, one thing we have to understand is that we're not going to be able to make, we're not going to be able to form the world that we truly want to see the, the truly sustainable world that we envision for the future without some very extreme sacrifices. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to do this uh, and still uh, maybe keep our moral purity about it. I, um, I really, one of, one of uh, the radical writers I really look up to, uh, a woman named Lear Keith, uh, I've heard her say many times, uh, the goal is not moral purity. Uh, the goal is to be effective. And, um, you know, there, there will, I think that many of us who are privileged need to, to really think about that. And one thing that I thought of when, when you were talking was another way to say this is we need to uh, make our allegiance uh, to the oppressed peoples of the world to, uh, the oppressed natural world, we need to make our allegiance to those people absolute. And we need to understand that uh, they are, are truly on the front lines of empire and they are choosing tactics that uh, are much more, are more serious than the ones that we're currently employing. And we need to understand that they're doing that uh, 
for their survival. Um, and so, I mean, there, there are groups around the world that are directly uh, confronting power in these ways. There's a group called the Movement to em Emancipate the Niger River Delta. I think they might have changed their name to the Niger River Avengers, but I think six or eight years ago, they sent a letter to uh, the main um, power players, the corporate uh, oil companies uh, that were destroying the Niger River and still are destroying the Niger River Delta. They sent a letter that very simply said, leave our country or die in it. And they've engaged for six or eight years in uh, sabotage of pipelines and even kidnapping uh, corporate uh, employees um, and ransoming, ransoming them. And uh, mainstream media often portrays these people as terrorists. Uh, but I think that we need to under, we need to pledge our allegiance to them. They are, they are, they, their, their tactics have in fact uh, cut Nigeria's uh, oil output by up to 40%. Um, and these are people, these are very poor people uh, who all of them collectively have less resources than you or I have individually, probably. And um, what they're doing is working. Uh, so I, I refer to examples like that to, to speak to uh, what you were saying about what it's actually going to take to confront empire and what it's actually going to take to dismantle empire. And yeah, just like you said about about Star Wars, you Star, it's a it's a it could be a a silly metaphor, but in a lot of ways it works. It, Star Wars, the movie isn't about um, the the uh, Galactic Senate sitting around having debates about how to curtail the power of the Emperor, how to um, how to undermine Darth Vader. The the movie is about and the movie reflects the truth, and that is uh, that dedicated militant uh, resistors have to be very strategic, and they have to they have to strike at the source of of uh, the power of empire. And the the torpedo that blew up the Death Star was was a perfect example. And I think that that's what that's the way we're going to have to start thinking. We're going to have to start thinking like military strategists and not as these disparate groups of, of single issue uh, organizers. We have to figure out where, um, where the vulnerabilities in the Death Star are and we, we need to figure out how to exploit those with the resources that we have. And I think that the work that National Community Rights Network is doing and the work that we've done with this Colorado River lawsuit is um, invaluable in teaching people the true nature of the empire is invaluable in teaching people what the Death Star actually looks like. And it is, there is going to be a critical mass of people needed to lead these and carry out these resistance tactics that will ultimately bring about the end of empire. I don't see that movement uh, formula forming um, very quickly. And so I still think that we need to, to lead people through these processes. We need to really break people of the idea that working through the system is going to work. And um, so, so local laws and local uh, lawsuits and campaigns to change the structure of government uh, are great educational tools, are great experiential processes where people uh, who maybe aren't, haven't quite realized that the Death Star is blowing them up, um, that they can go and confront the Death Star for themselves and realize, wow, uh, things are much more urgent, things are much more serious, there is a lot more happening than I was aware of, and then let them, it's a, it's a great way to persuade them um, to, to use better tactics. The lawsuits and the local laws, getting to that, okay, so um, let's make two distinctions here. There's the legal rights that you spoke about last time I spoke with you about, um, a, you know, a right is something that can be enforced, you know, by people with badges and uniforms and guns, you know. 
um, that the system, you know, grants rights this way uh, right now. And uh, so those are legal rights. And those pretty much fly in the face. They oppose uh, natural rights. So there's, you know, what we're asking for is the rights of nature, the rights of, you know, a river to exist and regenerate and flourish and, uh, you know, uh, rather than to become extinct, <laughs> like the 200 species every day. Um, so there's a, there's a legal right, and then there's an inalienable right that exists in nature that is a, a, a law of nature, a principle of nature. So communities and people have inalienable rights, and the community rights movement is about writing laws based on those inalienable rights, and in fact, the, the, the rights for the Colorado River is, is, in the same, is in the same playbook there. So what we want to do is create a narrative of our own, you know, to the counters the establishment uh, public relations narrative. And uh, so part of, of what we do is, um, is educational with these laws and these lawsuits. Uh, part of it is creating the groundwork for a better way of living where people see that if we were to change the system, basically turn it upside down so that, um, the, the, you know, the inalienable rights of nature and people and, and, um, and everything else that we might be able to imagine that has to do with, have to do with everything that has to do with existence, basically, about life, that all of life has the right to, to continue, not to be destroyed. Um, and that uh, the organizations, the systems, the people uh, that destroy nature are actually creating crimes against nature and, and, and against humanity. And um, so if we, if we frame that very clearly through, you know, manifestos, so to speak, laws, local laws and lawsuits, um, if we present a, a very good um, uh, pre uh, argument for the existence of inalienable rights and the, the founding of government based upon the uh, expansion and protection of those inalienable rights, then we have a, a, a system of, of relationship in the world where people are relating and nature is relating and people are relating with nature and vice versa. And, and so that would, that would be pretty much an ideal situation as far as I can tell it, tell, because you get to pursue your own inalienable rights to express yourself and to, um, you know, to, to live in whatever way you choose to live, as long as it doesn't trample on the rights of someone else to live the way they want to live. Uh, and so if we look at that balance, you know, if we look at the balance that our, the way that we live uh, doesn't step on the rights of the Colorado River to live, that's a powerful narrative. And I like doing this work because it, builds the narrative and it and it educates people on the narrative and it really sets the tone it sets the whole logical um emotional foundation for any kind of direct action it creates that moral foundation so that people know very deeply why they're behaving the way they are when they're going up against a pipeline or a fracking well, or, you know, aerial pesticide spraying, or whatever. Um, so I uh, want to thank you for doing what you're doing. You know, you're really helping uh, wake people up. And I think that's power. I think that's where the power is, is the awakening. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, the way... I think the way I, I agree with everything you said and, and one of the ways that I have come to conceptualize it and articulate it is um, I, I start with a basic uh, psychological principle, which is 
uh, we behave based off how we perceive the world. And um, the, another one of the great radical writers, Derek Jensen, he, he takes that principle and, and he says, he was, he, was intervie- he was talking with, a, uh, or, or he read something where a uh, Canadian lumberman said when he sees a forest full of trees, he sees dollar bills. And if you see forests as dollar bills, you will treat them one way. But if you see forests as living beings with valuable lives, you'll treat them another way. And so I think that the local laws and uh, the narrative that uh, the National Community Rights Network is creating is, is aimed at, uh, the way I understand it, is it helps change people's perceptions of of the living natural world. So if, if you see the natural world as possessing inalienable rights to life, just like you and I possess an inalienable right to life, uh, then you will, you will treat the natural world uh, differently than, than someone who sees the natural world as simply property. And, um, you know, I think that changing, I think the, the really good news for, for us is that Humans, I think one of the uh, one of the characteristics, one of the defining characteristics of human 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 nature, if if we want to call it, is that uh, if you want to change human behavior, you reward the behavior that you want, and you punish the behavior that you don't want. So in, in this culture, we can see it very clearly, you reward people who are willing to exploit the natural world with bigger incomes, with money, with even social prestige. And so you see a lot of people doing that. Um, and you punish people by not allowing them uh, that income, by, by you know, slandering them in, in the public, people like environmentalists. You discourage environmentalism um, through those tactics. Uh, but the, the really good news is that for the vast majority of human history, human beings understanding this principle created cultures where um, living in a, in, a tr- in a truly sacred relationship with the natural world was um, rewarded and uh, destroying the natural world uh, left you ostracized, left you um, shunned by your communities and uh, so cultures developed around the world um, that lived in balance with their land bases. And, and so I see that's, that's what I, I see that we're trying to do is we're trying to, um, we're in this war over, over how to um, influence human behavior. And we're in this war where we're trying to create um, you know, right now, our, our, our movements aren't very widespread. We're trying to create these little havens of, of sanity in a completely insane world. Um, but but it's, it's, a simple, it's a simple psychological principle. You, you change the way people perceive uh, the world, and they will, they will change their behavior accordingly. Um, and we just... Sometimes when I'm when I'm feeling um, really desperate about what's going on in the world, I I I have to remember that um, maybe maybe one of the most powerful things we're doing is by simply by resisting and doing everything we can to resist those that come after us. If the movement's stronger, they will have uh, these these examples and these stories within their own cultures of people that did resist and that will strengthen their own resistance uh, as we move forward. I'd like to um, wrap things up by reading the last paragraph, part of the last paragraph of your recent article. Um, Most of us are engaged in tactics that leave it up to someone else to do the right thing. The dismissal of our lawsuit is one more failure in a long list of failures to recognize the power we do possess and to use that power to protect the natural world. We fail and earth continues to heat up. We fail and human population continues to grow exponentially. 
We fail and the rate of species extinction intensifies. Each failure begs us to answer the question, why do we still seek change through means that have never worked? I think that's what we need to really take to heart here. We need to answer that question right now. And those of us who can answer it, you know, uh, I guess there's a couple of answers. One of them is that our answer would imply that we are insane. Uh, the other one would be that we're sane. I think one answer is that, you know, we're on the side of uh, life. And the other is that we're on the side of death. <laughs> you know, I don't know how to make it any clearer. And it really does place the responsibility on each of us. It, replace, it places an understanding and a responsibility that if it's, if it's going to come to be, it's up to me. You know, it's, it's all about the grassroots. And so the, the lawsuit is good because, you know, there's, we ran up against some issues here in Colorado where we had a community rights amendment that gave communities the right to local self-government. And uh, we, we started running that amendment as a petitioning campaign to start with. And, uh, you know, then we had like four different uh, amendments all of a sudden show up that were all funded by Representative Jared Paulus here in Colorado. And uh, so then all these people were you know, starting off getting signatures for our petitions. And then there was this petition that came up to ban fracking in the state of Colorado. You know, it wasn't rights based. Uh, it had all kinds of holes in it if you tried to defend it in the court uh, on, a, on, a, on the basis of rights. But it sounded good to people. And so they put all this trust in the establishment, so to speak. They circulated and got enough signatures. And at the, at the 11th hour, Jared Paul has pulled the thing because he was the one who was the, you know, the proponent and who had funded it. And so he pulled it in exchange for a, quote, blue ribbon commission on uh, oil and gas development in Colorado, which turned out to be a complete sham. And so believing in the system, having any amount of hope in the system, what that does is it paralyzes people from moving forward and taking meaningful action. We keep falling back on the, the hope, you know, that someone else is going to do this for us, that the system could work if we just tweak it here and there and so on and so forth. And then it stops us from going forward. And, and uh, you know, I think I've heard, I've heard uh, Derek speak about this, uh, you know, giving up of hope. And he says that when you've, given up hope, that's when it's possible for you to really get into action and really do something about your circumstances. First, yeah, I just want to say thanks again for, for the great conversation. And um, yeah, I think, I think that leaving it on, on Derek's uh, words about giving up hope uh, is a great place to, to leave it on. I think, um, it's, you know, a lot of people are scared to give up hope. It's, it's what, um, it's what gets them up in the morning. They say, um, I, I can, I can say that, um, I've given up hope and hope no longer gets me up in the morning, anger and rage and a, a consuming desire to build this, build this culture and leave, leave a world that we actually want to see exist and that we want to see our children and grandchildren and the natural world exist in um, is a much stronger medicine, and much more powerful motivator than hope ever was for me. Um, and I think if we can get there, then, then we're going to be a lot more effective. Well, thank you, Will. Um, yeah, i I always enjoy speaking with you and please keep us up to date. You always have us as a, as a platform for spreading the word. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to a whole bunch of lawsuits, um, granting rights of nature for everything that's living out there. I think, uh, 
you know, I think if, if communities want to do something like this, they can contact us. I know that uh, Deep Green Resistance can help them. Uh, I think if we work together, we can have a good, uh, a good powerful influence on communities. I think we need to move away from the, um, you know, I always like to say the establishment uh, environmental activism. We need to move away from the, you know, Sierra Club, Food and Water Watch, Environmental Legal Defense Fund, all those kind of actions that are really, um, you know, they're really designed to keep us in the fold, to keep us in the box of allowable activism and to act in predictable manners and to not achieve very much of a result. And, uh, you know, we have to look deeper. And the people in these organizations, a lot of them are really well intended. I know that I've spoken with some very fine people that participate in that type of old fashioned activism and reform. And they're really extraordinary people and they've been putting their whole heart and soul into this ever since the beginning. They never really look under the hood. They're not, they haven't looked at the issue of, you know, these basic fundamental and, and inalienable rights. Uh, they haven't looked at that issue in a really long time, if ever. They never go there, mostly trying to work within the system for better regulations and uh, trying to lobby your congressmen and, you know, write your people and phone them up and, you know, do petitions that are non-binding, you know, to try and rally the community and tell the bad guys, you know, we want them to be good guys and all that kind of stuff. And I think what we're, we found it from our experience is the bad guys are never going to be good guys. Maybe a few of them will wake up at the last few seconds of their life and say, you know, what was it all for, you know? And maybe they will rise and go to heaven, you know, when they have that realization. But in the meantime, they destroyed a tremendous amount of nature. So it's time, it's time to really go after the real root core of the problem and and begin to work at kicking that out and putting something back in its place that's really evolutionary that's life supporting rather than life destructive so i think the real value of your article for me is it communicates the idea in my mind that this recent event the dismissal of this lawsuit by some totalitarian, you know, attorney general, uh, that was not a failure. <laughs> that was a clear demonstration of how the system really is designed to work. And, um, you know, if we did a whole bunch of this stuff, I mean, people are going to wake up. They're going to see that, you know, these lawsuits are going on all over the country and the world, and the same result is happening over and over again, and we're going to keep doing it over and over again, not because we're insane, but because we want to basically deluge the system with grassroots activism and a, and a creative manifestation of the kind of things that we really want in life rather than resisting the things that we don't want so much. I agree. I think... Um... You know, we're speaking of hope, we're leaving people with, with uh, that broken hope. And whenever you break hope, there's an opportunity to, to point someone in a, in a new direction. And uh, I think the, the success, the, there's a success in breaking people's hope. And then there's a more important success in effective organizing and leadership uh, in the midst or, or in the wreckage of that hope to, to point people um, in, in a more effective way. And, uh, I think right now that's where we're at after the lawsuit. And, um, it's just really important that we mobilize, uh, people who are angry and people who are following along and just keep, we're going to keep chipping away at that rock. Thanks, Will. Thank you, Tom. Really great to talk to you. Thank you. You too. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks.